jobs. It's a 25 minute job, so uh, goes until 40 past the hour. Uh, right. So, so, so there you go. And questions, as as just mentioned, please ask on the on the chat or or one of the other forums as mentioned. So over to you, John. Thank you. Sorry, can you see my slides um, and my cursor? Okay. Uh, I can see your slide. I can see you. I can hear you loud and clear. John. Okay. Thank cool. You. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Um, I'm also coming at you from the Pacific uh, Coast. I'm on vacation in Seattle, but I am still uh, giving this talk. Um, all right, so I, I'm sort of pitching this. I was tasked with uh, giving this talk um, uh, as a sort of a broad overview of Lisa and its context in Canada, especially uh, uh, with an eye towards the Canadian uh, astronomy long range plan uh, for the next decade, which came out uh, for, for 2020. Um, uh, I, I'm sort of pitching this talk at Canadian astronomers who are interested in Lisa, um, but uh, but you know the, our Canadian astronomy community is relatively small, and the Lisa interested contingent is uh, still growing. And uh, one of the interesting, really interesting aspects of Lisa is that it sort of covers pretty much every 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 aspect of astrophysics, every topic. Um, and so no one person can be a uh, an expert in them all. And so because uh, a lot of our Canadian, Canadian least interested scientists um, come from very different fields, uh, not just gravitational waves, but also traditional electromagnetic astronomy um, uh, and also things like even astral particle physics. Um, so I, I'm just uh, providing a sort of a broad overview of um, Lisa uh, to to make sure everybody's on the same page, and I apologize if your favorite aspect of Lisa is not uh, is not mentioned in more detail. Okay, so moving on. Next, uh, okay, that's next. Okay, all right. So um, as you probably know, uh, Lisa is a gravitational wave detector. So gravitational waves are detected when you have essentially non-spherical masses um, that are rapidly rotating, right? So um, and you're probably familiar with uh, LIGO. Uh, LIGO has detected a lot of um, compact object mergers like black hole uh, black hole mergers. So you have two black holes that are in a binary system, and when they merge, they emit gravitational waves. And so this is just a visualization of the uh, gravitational waves that are uh, emitted when this occurs. Um, what's different about LISA is that uh, LISA will really detect gravitational waves from a very different population of, of uh, objects than LIGO. So LIGO has detected uh, gravitational waves from mergers of uh, essentially stellar mass black holes, um, tens of solar masses. Um, LISA will detect uh, black holes that are much larger masses, um, but are also um, a, a, diver a, a diverse variety of other uh, sort of binary systems. Um, and that's just, and that's because Lisa really operates in a very different uh, uh, frequency regime uh, when they talk uh, in for gravitational waves. Um, uh, and and Lisa is able to do this because uh, it is a um, a space-based uh, gravitational wave detector. It's a space-based interferometer. So it's a system of uh, three spacecraft in orbit, um, and the, the principle is, uh, is uh, the fundamental principle is similar to LIGO in that um, it is a laser interferometer. Um, however, uh, because these three uh, spacecrafts are, are in space in this Earth trailing orbit, uh, the, uh, the baselines of the arms are much, much longer, something like uh, two and a half uh, million kilometers. Um, and so LISA is actually able to detect gravitational waves that are uh, essentially um, uh, low, much lower frequency, much longer wavelengths. Um, and this is just a nice video showing, um, uh, visualizing the, the LISA spacecraft. Um, and yeah, you, and you can see how the spacecraft is in this orbit um, around the sun uh, that, and it sort of follows Earth. Um, all right, and oh, I, I should mention that, uh, yeah, so it, these three spacecraft are, um, you know, the, the, uh, they are constantly in motion and even their relative, uh, they're in constantly in motion relative to each other. And so that makes the interferometry um, very difficult because there's you know, natural time delays bet uh, between, uh, for the laser uh, to reach, to go from one of the spacecraft to the other. Um, and, and, uh, and in addition, you're trying to detect uh, uh, gravitational waves. Um, and, and that just makes the, uh, the, the data reduction very difficult, and indeed, um, the, the Lisa uh, collaboration is uh, uh, running a series of data challenges um, so that we can prepare for uh, the the huge 
wave of uh, data that will come out from Lisa um, and, uh, and figure out actually how to reduce this data and detect sources. Um, and one, one other thing I should note is that uh, Lisa is essentially uh, monitoring all sky all the time in, for gravitational waves, right? So it's not, um, unlike electromagnetic telescopes, it's, it's not something that you point, um, it's just uh, on all the time. Um, okay, and this is just visualize, uh, showing, sort of visualizing um, the, uh, the, the unique aspect of LISA um, in detecting gravitational waves in that if, uh, if you're familiar with LIGO, LIGO um, is, uh, detects gravitational waves at lower frequencies here um, on the, uh, uh, sorry, higher frequencies here on the left. Um, and you know that uh, LIGO has detected um, sources such as uh, uh, mergers of stellar mass black holes and also uh, murders of uh, bi uh, uh, binary neutron stars, or two neutron stars um, that are in a, uh, uh, in, in a uh, compact system. Um, however, uh, LISA will detect uh, gravitational waves from sources at lower frequencies. And at lower frequencies, there's um, whole new sources um, that, uh, that are detectable in gravitational waves. So for example, um, you can have uh, uh, mergers of two supermassive black holes or two massive black holes um, at the centers of galaxies. Um, you can also have, for example, uh, one massive black hole and one uh, stellar mass compact object. Well, uh, or it, it doesn't have to be um, a stellar mass. It, it could be you know, tens to hundreds of masses. Um, you, you can have these sort of systems. Um, and LISA will also detect a lot of uh, stellar systems like uh, uh, binary white dwarf systems, like these very compact binary white dwarf systems um, in our galaxy. And, um, and LISA sort of sits um, in this uh, frequency range in gravitational waves, and that's nicely between LIGO and also uh, at, at higher frequencies and at even lower frequencies, there are current um, uh, pulsar timing array efforts to detect um, even more massive black holes. Um, so at least it's sort, sort, sits sort of uh, between in, in frequency between um, ground-based experiments and pulsar timing arrays. Okay. Um, all right. And so uh, this is just to keep uh, get everybody up to speed. So in gravitational waves, um, you are detecting these ripples in space-time um, from these uh, mergers of, for example, two black holes here. Um, and and uh, on the x axis, I'm oh, sorry, on the y axis here is the gravitational wave strain on the uh, uh, oh, sorry, that's the y-axis. And this is the x-axis, which is showing um, uh, the, the strain over time as the merger occurs. So first you have the in-spiral uh, phase, um, and then you have the actual merger. And after the merger, there's the ring down phase. Um, and this is the uh, how the strain changes over time. And you can see that the frequency um, will, will shorten and it, it eventually you get this chirp signal, this uh, very characteristic ch uh, chirp signal from a uh, compact object merger. And you've, you've probably seen this uh, from uh, LIGO before because LIGO sees this from stellar mass black hole binaries as well. Um, one, one aspect of LISA that uh, should be appreciated is that from LIGO, you might be, uh, you might be used to thinking of uh, detecting these sort of compact object mergers at the merger phase, right? So LIGO, um, in LIGO, you're really seeing this merger phase where you really see the chirp. However, LISA is a, will be able to detect these mergers um, for much longer, um, and they, they will be able to detect them uh, in the in-spiral phase. So you're, oftentimes you're really looking at this part um, of, the, of, of the actual um, uh, this binary system during the in spiral. And uh, LISA will be able to follow this in spiral for uh, a long time. And not just you know, what we're used to uh, seconds to minutes uh, that we see in LIGO, but rather for LISA, you, you'll, you'll be able to see this in spiral phase for uh, days to uh, up to years, right? Um, so you're really looking at uh, this longer phase, this in spiral phase, um, in addition to the final trip at the end. Okay. So um, moving on. So this is the uh, classic uh, LISA sensitivity curve. Um, and what this curve is showing, again, on the y-axis, this is the, uh, the, the strain. On the x-axis is the uh, gravitational wave frequency. Um, the sensitivity curve is this sort of uh, black uh, dashed line here. Anything above this line, LISA will be able to detect. And uh, this, uh, this uh, figure also shows a, a variety of different sources. Right, so the, the, these are um, expected sources in LISA. Um, so for example, uh, mergers of black holes of uh, 10 to the seven solar masses, right? So 
uh, mergers of black holes of 10 to the six solar masses. So for example, the, the uh, black hole at the center of the Milky Way is about 10 to the six solar masses. Um, and uh, even smaller uh, black holes like 10 to the five solar masses. So if you have 10 to the five solar mass black holes that are merging, uh, Lisa will be able to detect them. Um, uh, in addition to black hole, uh, oh, and also I should note that you should, um, these are actually uh, trajectories over time, right? So you can see that for, for example, for this 10 to the six solar mass black hole merger. So these are, this is a merger of two 10 to the six solar mass black holes. Um, this is one year before merger. And then this is one month before merger, one day before merger. So you can see how um, as the merger, as the in spiral uh, continues, it, uh, this, um, this binary enters the LISA band um, and Lisa begins to be able to detect this, uh, this merger. Um, and you can follow it for essentially months all the way uh, until you actually hit the actual merger. Um, all right, and so it, it, in addition to these black hole binaries, uh, Lisa will be able to detect a bunch of other objects such as um, uh, these galactic white dwarf binaries in our galaxy. The, um, and, uh, uh, they'll, so they'll just be this sort of, um, a whole bunch of what are essentially point sources. They're not actually transients. They're essentially persistent point sources in gravitational waves. Uh, and these are uh, white dwarf binaries in our galaxy. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll mention more about those. Um, and um, there are um, these MREs, these extreme mass ratio uh, in spirals, which I'll talk more about. Um, and these lines here are, are actually um, stellar mass black holes that are detectable by LIGO. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, they, uh, some of them are detectable also in LISA. Um, and I'll, I will talk more about those as well. Okay, so first um, I wanna focus uh, just on the uh, sort of massive black hole binaries uh, for a minute. Um, just to bring everybody on the same page, you know, we, we do know that in addition to uh, stellar mass black holes detected by LIGO, uh, we do know that massive black holes also exist. So these are central massive black holes. And I'm saying massive because, uh, you know, instead of supermassive, because, uh, you, you know, we, we know that the, these black holes, these massive black holes at the centers of the galaxies can reach masses of 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 solar masses. Um, but uh, LIGO will, oh, sorry, LISA will mostly detect uh, these uh, uh, black holes that are of 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 solar masses. Um, and these will be uh, central black holes in smaller galaxies. So some of them will be, for example, in Milky Way sized or even smaller, like dwarf galaxies, that that will be the majority of the black holes um, mergers detected in LISA. Um, but there is a lot of evidence that uh, these massive black holes do exist. So for example, there's very clear evidence showing here of the uh, uh, S stars at the center of the Milky Way, um, sh showing their, uh, following their uh, essentially orbital motion over time, and they seem to be orbiting some massive object that's uh, not seen. Um, and you can calculate the mass of that object just based on these orbits. Uh, and it turns out that yes, the, 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 the mass of that central object has to be um, something like 10 to the six solar masses. So that has to be a black hole. And furthermore, uh, this is true, not only for our Milky Way, but rather uh, our galaxy, the Milky Way, but we think that all massive galaxies uh, also harbor central massive black holes. Now, as you go towards smaller, uh, smaller galaxies, and which tends to have smaller uh, central black holes, uh, do every single galaxy have a, um, have a central black hole? That is sort of an open question. And in fact, um, it, whether or not, for example, dwarf galaxies, all dwarf galaxies have central black holes is not, not only, a, uh, not only a, a sort of an open question, but also it's depend, it depends on what, uh, how exactly you think these massive black holes actually formed at high redshifts in the early universe. And, it, and, that, and that in itself is a open question. Um, and I, I will talk more about that, but that is a question that uh, Lisa will, um, will answer and address. Um, hold on, let me go to the next slide. Next slide. Okay. All right. So, um, okay. So, we, we, we think that all galaxies, um, at least massive galaxies, have central black holes. Um, but, you know, do, LISA will be de uh, detecting their mergers. Do they, well, will these massive black holes be merging? Well, yes, in our hierarchical, uh, you know, a model of galaxy formation, um, galaxies grow over cosmic time through mergers, right? So um, at, at early times, you have a lot of smaller galaxies and uh, some of them will merge. And when they merge, they form bigger galaxies. Um, and when they merge, we think that uh, their central black holes will also merge. 
Um, and there's a lot of complicated astrophysics as to how the, you know, when two galaxies merge, how, how their central black holes will um, sink um, and, uh, and get to the center and eventually um, be able to enter this gravitational wave driven regime where you, it, emits, it loses angular momentum through gravitational waves and you can detect it through LISA. Um, how that whole entire process uh, works is uh, very complicated um, and uh, you know, is worth another talk. But uh, my point here is that if, you know, in, in, our, in hierarchical galaxy formation, galaxies merge and so their central black holes must merge. Um, and, and thus LISA will detect a lot of mergers of massive black holes at the centers of galaxies. Um, and this is just a uh, a video. It's a plane. Yeah, okay. And this is the video from a, uh, a cosmological simulation of galaxy formation showing um, these mergers of uh, the, the formation of a, a galaxy through mergers of smaller galaxies at higher redshifts. So this is evolving from uh, high redshifts to low redshifts, and you can see that there's all kinds of uh, mergers going on. And each of these mergers of these smaller galaxies, I mean, we, we think that these smaller galaxies all, also have massive black holes at their center. And so when these small galaxies merge to form a bigger galaxy, that there will absolutely be mergers um, of their central black holes as well, that, and they will be detectable, detectable by LISA. Um, and uh, we, we will be able to trace these mergers uh, at, over cosmic time, right? So how, what is the merger rate of galaxies um, as a function of mass as, and as a function of redshift? Um, and in this way, we're also probing um, the assembly of galaxies over cosmic time as well. All right, um, I, I won't uh, keep going. Oh, no, next slide. Okay. Um, this is sort of a very cool uh, a key plot from Lisa, which is just showing um, the de sort of the detectability of black hole mergers um, as a function of mass and as a function of redshift. Right, so the more um, uh, you know, the, the the lower redshift a merger is, the easier it is for Lisa to detect. Um, and there is a certain sort of mass uh, range that Lisa is uh, most detectable. So um, on the y-axis here is showing the redshift. On the x-axis is showing the black hole mass. Um, and uh, the, the point here is, oh, and also uh, these numbers here are the signal to noise that the merger, uh, that, that LISA will, will have, uh, in, that, that the merger will have in LISA. So for example, um, you know, if you have a merger of uh, a, a couple of 10 to the five solar mass black holes at redshift 10, um, you, LISA will be able to detect them with uh, uh, these mergers with signal to noise about 200. Now, the, the really key point here is that if you look at this redshift range on the y-axis, this goes up um, to well into beyond reionization into cosmic dawn, right? So this is redshift of uh, greater than 10 up to 20. So LISA will be able to detect massive black hole mergers out to redshift of, you know, beyond 20 with very high signal to noise, right? They, these, are, uh, these are very high signal to noise of uh, tens to hundreds, uh, hundreds um, and, at, uh, and at very high redshifts at cosmic dawn where electromagnetic observations can't really see much. Um, not only is, is, our, our, is it just really far um, and there's just not a whole lot of very bright objects at redshift 20 that we can detect with our telescopes, but also um, you know, the, the uh, universe is much more uh, 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 the, the optically thick at those redshifts, right? So um, by detecting uh, these black hole mergers at redshift 20 were really probing an epoch in the universe that uh, is very difficult to probe through e e electromagnetically. And we're able to do this through gravitational waves. So this is a kind of a very uh, uh, astounding plot, uh, probably my favorite plot uh, about Lisa. Okay, next. Okay, um, just, okay, so moving on from the black hole mergers, um, I also want to mention um, the ver these uh, white dwarf binaries, these verification binaries that are um, here. Um, so these are binaries, um, not in other galaxies, but in our galaxy, the Milky Way. Um, and uh, they're, they're mostly uh, white dwarf, white dwarf binaries. Um, and we know of a variety of them. So this is uh, uh, also sort of a, uh, uh, a uh, the sensitivity curve on the uh, x-axis, oh, sorry, on the y-axis here is a strain, on the x-axis here is the uh, gravitational wave frequency, um, and this is uh, this curve here is the uh, LISA um, sensitivity. Uh, anything above that curve is detectable by LISA. All of these points here are different uh, white dwarf, uh, 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 these white dwarf binary systems. Um, there's uh, a lot of these are um, AM CAM band systems where you have very, uh, very compact, very short period um, white dwarf binaries. Um, and th these will, these are essentially persistent sources 
so they're not, um, you know, they're, they're not tr really transient sources, they're persistent sources in LISA. And um, it, we can detect them uh, through our telescopes, but also in LISA. And so they're verification binaries, and uh, they're, they're very valuable to uh, verify uh, the, the data from LISA because we, we sort of know their, we can measure their periods. And in, in some of them, we can actually, um, in some of these binaries, we can actually measure um, in, in uh, you know, in, in electromagnetically in their light curves, we can actually measure the, the uh, period decay. Um, so we sort of uh, have a very good idea of what the gravitational waves should look like. And when LISA do, does detect these, uh, uh, these binaries, um, we, we, uh, it allows us to verify that the data is, we're reducing the data correctly. Um, there's a lot of other science you can do with these uh, binary systems, um, such, as, such as probing their uh, evolution and formation. Um, uh, I, I am not an expert on uh, uh, binary white dwarf stars, um, so I will leave it at that. But also, um, you can also probe the, uh, the, the uh, Milky Way structure as well, because you can see these binaries on the uh, other side of the uh, uh, on the other side of the Milky Way. Um, all right, and uh, I want to mention these MREs. Uh, these are extreme mass ratio bin uh, uh, in spirals. So these are these curves, these red curves um, uh, down here. And what these extreme mass ratio, ratio uh, in spirals are, are is just a, uh, a very massive black hole um, that's merging with a much less massive black hole. So say, I don't know, say, say a 10 to the six solar mass black hole that's merging with a, uh, with a 30 solar mass black hole. Um, and the reason is, so the mass ratio is very large, right? Um, and so the, and the mass ratio is very extreme. The, the reason why these um, emeries are very, uh, very interesting is because uh, you, when, at, so the, the uh, smaller black hole, the, the lower mass black hole will, uh, will orbit around um, the larger black hole uh, for many orbits. You, you will be able to see essentially thousands and thousands of orbits in LISA. Um, and the orbit is very complex and, and uh, by sort of uh, observing these uh, these thousands of orbits um, during during the in spiral, um, we're able to actually uh, look at the gravitational waves and map out the space time around the the massive black hole, um, and that's very interesting. Um, and be, because uh, you can use them for tests of GR. Um, uh, for electromagnetic observers, um, it, EMRIs are also very exciting because uh, if the, the, smaller, uh, the smaller object, the lower mass object, doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily have to be a black hole. It could be, for example, a neutron star or a white dwarf. And in that case, the neutron star or white dwarf will experience uh, you know, uh, tidal forces. Um, and you can use the resulting gravitational waves to probe things like the nuclear uh, equation of state uh, and or, uh, for example, white dwarf structure. So there's a lot of interest in um, uh, EMRIs from uh, electromagnetic observers as well. Um, oops, uh, next, cool. All right, and I think lastly, I wanted to uh, mention uh, these lines here, which are um, uh, binaries. These, these are black hole, black hole binaries that are um, in, in this LISA band, uh, it, detectable by LISA, where's my cursor? You can see that they are detectable by LISA here, um, but, but as they uh, you know, continue they're in spiral, um, they will move to uh, higher, higher frequencies, and they will actually move uh, from the, so this is the same sensitivity curve for LISA here, but uh, for these, uh, uh, for some of these uh, low mass um, black hole mergers, um, they will move out of the LISA sensitivity band towards higher frequencies and enter the sensitivity band for ground-based gravitational wave detectors, such as LIGO. Okay, so for example, here in green is a LIGO-like binary. So these are binaries that are detected by LIGO that have tens to, you know, that have tens to maybe a hundred solar masses. Um, and uh, in the blue here is uh, more massive objects, uh, um, uh, mergers of uh, black holes that have, um, you know, a, a few thousand solar masses. Um, but for, for both of this, these cases, what you can see is, uh, you know, if, so for here, for example, four years before the actual merger, um, it's in the LISA band, but then um, as, uh, as time goes on, it actually exits the LISA band to higher frequencies and enters um, the LIGO band, the, the advice advanced LIGO band, or um, for a fourth generation ground-based detectors like Einstein telescope. Um, and so what, what happens is you essentially are able to de detect uh, these murders in with both uh, instruments, um, and uh, but at sort of different phases of their uh, in spiral. Um, for for Lisa, it's going to be the, the um, uh, 
uh, in earlier in spiral and for uh, uh, the ground-based telescopes is going to be the actual merger. Um, and this is interesting because uh, LISA will essentially give you a lot of uh, a warning, a forewarning of several years uh, in some cases of, uh, of that a merger is going to occur. And then four years later, you will actually be able to, you will actually see that merger occur uh, in using these ground-based detectors. So that, that's very interesting as well. John, would you like to wrap up? Oh, sure. Um, okay, so uh, I, I, I have five minutes left. Is that right, Soraya? Or less? I think your time is up. Okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> you can I, take a minute or so, yeah. So uh, let me just say that Lisa will uh, answer a lot of science questions, such as what is the origin of massive black holes at the centers of galaxies? Um, what is the co-evolution of uh, the central galaxies and their black holes? Um, Lisa will, uh, some of these black hole mergers in Lisa will have, uh, will be actively accreting. So we'll be able, using uh, electromagnetic telescopes, we'll be able to probe the nature of accretion flows around these uh, binary black holes. Um, Lisa will be able to do cosmology uh, and, uh, because uh, mergers can be used as uh, standard sirens. Um, and also, uh, later, uh, you'll hear talks on um, uh, on Canadian electromagnetic telescope uh, uh, priorities from our long-range plan, including Castor. I think uh, Tyrone Woods is giving a talk on that, um, and uh, as well as uh, the Vera Rubin Observatory. I think Maria Drought is giving a talk on that. Um, but uh, I, I just want to um, uh, note that uh, you know the, Lisa is not ex explicitly ranked in the uh, Canadian Astronomy Long Range Plan, and that's partially because um, gravitational wave astronomy is still relatively um, uh, new, especially to Canada, and the Canadian expertise is still growing. And in fact, many of us um, uh, in Canada who are at least interested were not actually uh, did not were not actually in Canada and did not actually have uh, you know permanent positions in Canada um, uh, as of the 2020 long range plan. Um, however, uh, we are now beginning to reach a critical mass, um, and so that's why in the next talk you'll see, uh, you'll hear about uh, the push for uh, Canadian uh, uh, participation and possibly in the form of a hardware contribution. All right. Thank you. And I'll end there. Th thank you, John, very much for your talk. Uh, we are running a couple of minutes over time, I believe. So, uh, so thanks again, and 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 uh, th there's good questions in the chat, and and some of it them are already being answered, so that's great to see. Uh, please feel free to look at the chat uh, for questions, and uh, we, can, we can come back to them later if you have time. So thanks again, and uh, it's my pleasure to, to welcome Domenico Giardi.